Hello. This video provides an overview of civically engaged research. The Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching defines university community engagement as collaboration between institutions of higher education and their larger communities, local, regional, state, national, global, for the mutually beneficial exchange of knowledge and resources in a context of partnership and reciprocity. Civically engaged research is a collaborative type of inquiry, learning, and science communication. It tackles real-world problems, challenges, and public issues like poverty, ecological degradation, and climate change in hands-on, bi-directional ways. Good civically engaged research is ethically mindful, conceptually rigorous, methodologically sound, and authentically reciprocal. Authentically reciprocal means the costs, benefits, and risks associated with the design, conduct, and sharing of the research are equitably shared among those involved. The significance of civically engaged research is on the rise. To understand this, it is necessary to understand the dynamic and changing role research universities play in society. The globalization of science, technology, and education is accelerating and deepening worldwide. Universities are facing mounting pressure to respond to increasingly complex problems and risks like peak oil and food insecurity. This is giving rise to a new mode of knowledge production, referred to as Mode 2. The more traditional academic practice is Mode 1. At the risk of oversimplifying matters, <clears throat> mainstream science, which is Mode 1, knowledge production, is organized by disciplines and conducted by scholarly communities that use frameworks defined by their disciplines, like biology, geography, engineering, chemistry, or political science. Civically engaged research, which is a form of mode two knowledge production, takes a different approach. Knowledge is produced through participatory methods that involve the community in framing research priorities and determining the questions to be studied. Community knowledge and engagement in this context is as valuable as scientific knowledge and experimental methods. This is a crucial point. Mode two's emphasis is on transdisciplinary collaboration in use-inspired, problem-solving, solutions-oriented ways. There are two camps of thought about Mode 2. The first is comprised of university leaders and scholars who advocate the privatization of the academy following a conservative ethos focused on commercialization. This stems in part from the mounting pressure placed on universities to spur regional innovation and competitiveness by capitalizing on the economic benefits of science and knowledge. The second camp is made of university leaders and scholars who aim to make the academy more accountable from social justice and equity standpoints through civically engaged approaches to teaching, research, and service learning. The two approaches are not necessarily mutually exclusive. They constitute a mixed bag including opportunities and threats embodied in conflicts over the university's mission internal culture, governance, and allocation of resources. The National Research Council, or NRC, issued an important report in 1999 titled Our Common Journey, The Transition to Sustainability. It is a major milestone in what we call sustainability science. The report called for the creation of knowledge action collaboratives. These are alliances of diverse groups that value transdisciplinarity and community knowledge. The challenges we face in the 21st century require knowledge action collaboratives capable of designing strategies and institutions skilled at engendering adaptive management, resilience, and social learning for sustainable development. Sustainable development, per the widely cited Brundtland definition, is development that meets the needs of society's current generation without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. The NRC's Board on Sustainable Development lists three priority tasks for advancing a civically engaged research agenda focused on sustainability science and regional development. First, develop a research framework for the science of sustainable development that integrates global and local perspectives to shape a place-based understanding of the interactions between environment and society. Second, initiate focused research programs 
on a small set of understudied questions that are essential to a deeper understanding of those interactions. And third, promote better utilization of existing tools and processes for linking knowledge to action in pursuit of a sustainability transition. These priorities underscore the importance of challenges for theory building and practice relevant to civically engaged research in sustainability science. There is a pressing need to identify appropriate ecological and biogeophysical terms of reference, for example, watersheds and food sheds, for place-based research on environment-society interdependencies. Much more is needed in the way of building incentives and capacity for knowledge networking and resource sharing across diverse programs on a regional scale. The report identifies the region as the most useful territorial unit or geographical scale for organizing sustainability initiatives. This slide illustrates the relationship of research universities and civil society in the context of regional scale problem solving. It's adapted from work done in collaboration with Joe Ravitz. What we see working from the top to the bottom is A, research universities, civil society, and regional scale problem solving show little integration. B, heightened emphasis on public participation and governance in the 1980s brought civil society into problem solving at the regional scale. But universities still generally operated on agendas outside localized regional concerns. And C, an idealized representation of all parts working together for collective benefit at a regional scale. We aren't there yet. The Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching places the benefits and purpose of collaborative community engagement in a broader context. The Foundation states that the purpose of community engagement is the partnership of college and university knowledge and resources with those of the public and private sectors to enrich scholarship, research, and creative activity, enhance curriculum, teaching, and learning, prepare educated, engaged citizens, strengthen democratic values and civic responsibility, address critical societal issues, and contribute to the public good. Many institutions of higher education around the world are now seeking ways to educate and train students in the theory and practice of civically engaged research. One example is the Tayleries Network, a global coalition of over 300 engaged universities in over 70 countries worldwide. Their guiding document, the Tayleries Declaration, draws attention to the civic roles and social responsibilities of higher education. The university should use the processes of education and research to respond to, serve, and strengthen its communities for local and global citizenship. The university has a responsibility to participate actively in the democratic process and to empower those who are less privileged. Our institutions must strive to build a culture of reflection and action by faculty, staff, and students that infuses all learning and inquiry. To close, I'd like to say something about academic freedom with respect to civic engagement. Can researchers be passionate about their civically engaged research and communicate their critical viewpoints about important and controversial questions? The answer is yes. The University of California has an academic personnel policy, APM-010, in support of its commitment to uphold and preserve principles of academic freedom. I'll take a minute here to read a few sections of this policy that are worth highlighting. The principles of academic freedom protect freedom of inquiry and research, freedom of teaching, and freedom of expression and publication. These freedoms enable a university to advance knowledge and to transmit it effectively to its students and to the public. The university also seeks to foster in its students a mature independence of mind, and this purpose cannot be achieved unless students and faculty are free within the classroom to express the widest range of viewpoints in accord with the standards of scholarly inquiry and professional ethics. The exercise of academic freedom entails correlative duties of professional care when teaching, conducting research, or otherwise acting 
as a member of the faculty. The original language of the APM-010, which was drafted in 1934, associated academic freedom with scholarship that gave play to the intellect rather than to passion. It conceived scholarship as dispassionate and is concerned only with the logic of the facts. The revised version of APM 010 holds that academic freedom depends on the quality of scholarship, which is to be assessed by the content of scholarship, not by the motivations that led to its production. The revision of APM 010 therefore does not distinguish between quote unquote interested and quote unquote disinterested scholarship. It differentiates instead between competent and incompetent scholarship. Although competent scholarship requires an open mind, this does not mean the faculty are unprofessional if they reach definitive conclusions. It means rather that faculty and student researchers must always stand ready to revise their conclusions in light of new evidence or further discussion. Although competent scholarship requires the exercise of reason, this does not mean the faculty are unprofessional if they are committed to a definite point of view. It means, rather, that faculty must, from their point of view, form, sorry, form their point of view by applying professional standards of inquiry rather than succumbing to external and illegitimate incentives such as monetary gain or political coercion. Competent scholarship can and frequently does communicate salient viewpoints about important and controversial questions. I hope you found this brief introduction to civically engaged research inspiring and useful. Thanks for watching.